Uh, before I, I, I pray and jump into the talk, I want to just lead off by saying this. Reading scripture, memorizing scripture, meditating on scripture is the single most profound, significant, important daily habit that you can form in your life. And if you take nothing else from my talk today, just go home and start reading the Bible. All right. At the very end of the talk, I have a QR code. I'll have a QR code on the screen. And I put together this little guide, three or four pages that has some questions for you to engage with scripture as you read. It actually also has a suggested reading plan at the end that uh, if, if you've ever tried to do like a one year Bible reading plan, most people drop off after like Genesis, Exodus, and then get to Leviticus. And it's like walking through mud a little bit. And then you get the numbers and you're like, I'm out. Uh, so so I've I've made it to like Deuteronomy before on one of those plans before I was just like, ah, I need to go to the Psalms or the New Testament. I, I can't. Uh, and, and so, so I've, I've tapped out on one of those like one year Bible reading plans. So uh, the plan that is included basically just walks you through the Old Testament without skipping some books uh, while also giving you a lay of the land. So I think it goes uh, Genesis, Exodus, and then it jumps to Joshua, the entry of the promised land. <laughs> Uh, and then, and then it doesn't have you go through all the prophets either. It's like, here are a couple minor prophets. Here's one major prophet. And then, and then Psalms. And anyways, uh, it's a good, it gives you like a good lay of the land for the Old Testament. So if, if you've ever found it like, hey, that feels like kind of an impossible task. Uh, hey, dude, don't worry about it. It's all good. I'll just, yeah, I'll turn around. I'll keep, I'll keep my eye on what's, uh, what's behind me. But thank you, Ethan. I appreciate you. All right. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this time of worship where uh, we could look to you and fix our eyes on you. Holy Spirit, would you come and refresh us tonight? Uh, be our teacher. We want to hear from you. Uh, Lord, I pray that our hearts tonight would be good soil for the seed of your word, that your word would bear fruit in our lives 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you just custom fit something of tonight's message to speak every single person in the room today and god's beautiful people said amen amen all right well i'm something of a, a history nerd and i will tell you it's not possible to talk about reading the bible without talking about the protestant reformation all right so that's that's where we're going to start and, and here's why this is significant because uh, up until the Protestant Reformation takes place, so this is a 16th century, our early 1500s, uh, there is no biblical literacy to speak of. The main Bible that was used by the church in the West, the Catholic church, was a Latin translation by St. Jerome uh, from a thousand years earlier. All right. And uh, by the time the Reformation happened, uh, Latin was dead. OK, so Latin took a long snooze. Nobody speaking Latin. Nobody understands Latin except for the clergy. And so in town, you had one Bible. It was in church and it was chained to the pulpit. And it was preached and read in a language that the average person didn't know. So nobody had knowledge of the Bible. In fact, I want you to meet uh, this guy. Uh, any, any, anybody know who that is? Uh, no, that's a, that's a great guess. We're going to meet him momentarily. If Felix was here, he would tell you, this is Menno Simons. He's the founder of the Mennonite denomination. But before he had his reformation breakthrough, uh, Menno Simons was a Dutch Catholic priest. Okay, check this out. At 28 years old, he was an ordained Catholic priest. He had never read the Bible. A Catholic priest had never read the Bible. He was like, I, I, I can't read. I'm, I'm, I'm going to like read the church fathers. I can't read the scripture. So, so that's how kind of like that, that was the low in, in church history. OK, but the Reformation actually changed all that. All right. I will talk about the impact of the Reformation uh, for a moment. OK, you guys know who this person is. Axel, I might need you to, I might need you on back up over there. You just, yeah, I'll just tell you when to click. Oh, you're the best. Thank you. Okay. You guys know who this guy is? All right. So uh, I, I don't have, I don't have this other picture of him, but he actually, when he was a Catholic monk, he was very skinny. He was very, very skinny because he was just like torturing himself, trying to please God. And once he had his reformation breakthrough, he put on weight like crazy. <laughs> All right. He married an ex-nun. So he's an ex-monk, marries an ex-nun, and she moves into his uh, uh, a monastery because all of the monks are out. They are, he got them all wives. And then so that ex-nun, Catherine Rambour, moved into his monastery and uh, uh, basically 
made like half of it, turned half of it into a personal private brewery. And he would write all the time about like how much he loves his wife's beer. So anyways, uh, so Martin Luther put on weight like crazy. But one of the things that he did, his incredible contribution is that he was the first man to translate the Bible into the everyday language vernacular of the people. And he got in trouble for it. How dare you translate the Bible into German? And what he did was he allowed any literate person to be able to pick up God's word and to read it for themselves. This is incredible. Uh, the other person I want you guys to meet. Okay, we can go to the next. Okay, who knows who this guy is? <laughs> That's your guy, Andre. That's William Tyndale. William Tyndale was uh, an English reformer. Okay, he's a, a British reformer. And uh, he is the one who gave us, if any of us have an English Bible in this room, he is the father of the English Bible. He is also the father of the English language. When he translated the Bible for the very first time into English from the original languages of Greek and Hebrew, he literally invented words that were not in the English language yet. He gave us words like scapegoat and Jehovah. And what are some words he gave us? He gave us the words atonement, Passover, mercy seat. This man literally invented these words. Now, he's going to go on to be burned at the stake and to, and to die because his New Testament translation was illegal. It was contraband. The British bishop had outlawed anybody to read the Bible in their mother tongue of English. And so people were getting arrested because they were reading the, the, the Bible in their own language. Okay, now, why am I... Like, why are we, why are we starting here in, in, in a conversation about uh, reading scripture? It's important for you to recognize the cost that was paid for you to have a Bible. Man, we take it for granted. We have the ESV and the NIV and the NLT and the NKJV and, you know, every version under the sun. And we have it in paper Bibles and everywhere. We have extra copies to give to our friends. We have it on our phone and our tablet. And do we read it? Do we study it? Do we obey it? Do we know it? The cost that was paid for us to have a Bible in our own language is high. People paid for you to have a Bible with their lives. You know, there are still uh, about 1,800 languages worldwide that don't have any portions of the Bible translated into them. Over 1,800 languages. And we have an abundance of scripture. So anyways... I hope you'll have a little bit more of an appreciation for the reformers and for the reformation. Uh, they were not perfect men, but they were great men. And we are standing on their shoulders. And the fact that we have Bibles in our languages, and we owe that to people like William Tyndale and Martin Luther. So for the rest of our time, uh, those are going to be our guides. All right. So we're, we're, I'm, we're, I'm going to quote Martin Luther several times. I'm going to quote John Calvin, Philip Melanchthon, a few of the other reformers, uh, but they'll be our guides as we look at this topic of like how to read the Bible. So the reformers, they, uh, they recovered the gospel. They recovered the doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone. That, that we are justified, that we are made right with God by grace alone, that it's a free gift, by faith alone, so not by our works, but simply by believing that Jesus has died for us uh, through Christ alone. Those are, those, are, those are called the solas of the Reformation, the five solas of the Reformation. I have, yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, in Christ alone, that's, that's the person that we trust to the glory of God alone. And for our purposes tonight, the most significant one is this is all based on scripture alone. Sola scriptura. Sola scriptura. Yeah. Did the Catholic Church not do this? Not do this? Uh, no. In fact, there was such a thing as the Counter Reformation. And in the Counter Reformation, the Catholic response to the Protestant Reformation, uh, they said something along the lines, and this is like, like a, a very close paraphrase because I, I just recently came across this. We hold that the scriptures and the church tradition are basically like on equal grounds. And so they're both authoritative. As opposed to the reformers' emphasis on scripture alone being our final authority. So for example, uh, Luther uh, was arrested. They brought him to the Diet of Worms, which is basically like a hearing. And they put all his books on this stack, uh, on this table. And they were like, hey, Luther, uh, do you recant? Your, your works. Are these your works? And do you recant? And uh, he gave a long speech, but at the very end of it, he closes with this very, very epic line. Unless I am convinced by the testimonies 
of the scriptures or by clear arguments that I'm in error for popes and councils have often erred and contradicted themselves, I cannot recant and I will not recant for I am subject to the scriptures that I've quoted. He says, it's my conscience is captive to the word of God. It is unsafe and dangerous to do anything against one's conscience. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And so the, the line was drawn and the emphasis in the Protestant Reformation is that the scriptures are the final authority. The scriptures are the ones that tell the church what to believe, not the other way around. The church does not say the scriptures say da 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 The scriptures say the church believes everything that, that, that's written in them. Okay, are you guys tracking with me? All right, okay, let's, let's uh, keep going. Uh, this is our book. Christians are a people of the book. And we study and read scripture as our duty and as our delight. And uh, if you've ever had a moment where you're reading scripture and like something jumps off the page at you and you're like, oh my gosh, exactly what I need to hear. You know what I'm talking about. We read it and obey it as our duty and delight. And we neglect it to our spiritual detriment and, and our spiritual peril. And I want to say also, if you have ever been taught, maybe implicitly, that the Bible is really hard to understand. Professionals kind of study, you need like a Bible degree in order to read it. Uh, or that the Bible is boring. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. None of those things are true. As, as, as we'll see in a little bit. Okay, so I want to ask tonight, uh, what is the Bible? As we dig into how to read it, what is the Bible? The Bible is a collection of writings that Christians consider uniquely inspired by God. In other words, you can say shorthand, the Bible is God's word. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is God's word. I have a chart here that kind of breaks down the, the books of the Bible. So there's 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. By the way, the word testament comes from the Latin testamentum, which literally means uh, covenant or agreement. And so roughly speaking, the Old Testament refers to the Old Covenant that was ratified at Mount Sinai between the people of Israel, the Jewish nation and God. And uh, the, the New Covenant, the New Testament is about the New Covenant that was promised and prophesied in the Old Testament that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And, uh, oh, Tim Callie's, uh, your guy, Andre, had this other chart up. I really liked it. It's like a, yeah, I was, was it, the, the periodic table of, 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 of Bible, Bible books. Uh, but anyways, I really, I really like this. If you guys want it, I can add it into, into the handout uh, later. But uh, St. Augustine, uh, who uh, is like the patron saint for like the reformers and the Catholics. Okay, Man, he's so interesting. He's just like an intellectual giant. Uh, and inside his head was the idea of like grace as a Catholic concept. And at the same time, he like fought Pelagius. And uh, who was like, oh, we're saved by works. He was like, no, we're not saved by works. It's like, Augustine, which one is it? And so he's just this like towering figure over church history. And, uh, and everybody looks to him and reads him. He's a uh, fourth, fifth century uh, early church father. But he said this about the Old and the New Testament. The new is in the old concealed. All right. There's, you can see glimpses of it. You can make connections uh, to it. But, but it's essentially concealed. And the old is in the new revealed. In other words... The Bible is a connected whole, and it's a connected whole story that leads to Jesus. That leads to Jesus. Come on, guys. You're, are you awake tonight? Somebody say Jesus. 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 The Bible is one story that leads to Jesus. Now, uh, I want to walk you through the, the meta narrative of Scripture, kind of the general storyline of the Bible. Uh, this is one way to summarize it, okay? Creation, fall redemption and consummation or, or new creation. And so uh, where do we read about creation? Where in the Bible is that? Genesis. Yeah, Genesis. What chapters? One. Yeah, one and two. All right. Yeah, that's it. Genesis one and two. And, and basically we meet God and he is creating the world and he speaks and everything comes to be. Uh, Psalm 33 says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Check this out. Colossians in the New Testament, Paul says this, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created. 
Whoa, that means when I read Genesis, I see Jesus at work creating the universe, creating Adam and Eve, involved in the tiniest details of creation. So, and then we get to, to the fall. So uh, where, where is that at in the Bible? Yeah, also Genesis chapter three. Man, very early. I mean, like that's a roller coaster. All right. I mean, you tell you, you start on page one, a lot happens. Okay. 50% of the plot line happens in the first three chapters. So our first parents, Adam and Eve, eat of the fruit of the of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They they rebel against God. They they spit in God's face and say, We reject your loving and caring and kind authority over us. We want to do things our own way. And so when you turn from the only source of life, all you have is death. When you turn from the only source of light, all you have is darkness. And so they are dead and, and death and sin enter the world through them because Adam and Eve sinned. And so consequently, we all experience sin and physical and spiritual death. Uh, but then thirdly, okay, redemption, redemption. Uh, there are glimpses of that throughout the Old Testament and, and patterns and shadows. And so, for example, Moses, he delivers his people out of slavery in Israel. And in the New Testament, we meet Jesus, who is the new and better Moses, who delivers us out of slavery to sin and death. All right, so Moses, in other words, is a shadow of Jesus. Another type of salvation and redemption in the Old Testament is Joshua. So Joshua brings his people into the promised land and he leads his people into victory against the Canaanites. And Jesus is the better Joshua. He is the new and better Joshua who brings us into the promised land of God's love and God's eternal salvation. And he is the one who fights our battles and he's the one who leads us in victory. So I say that to, to just kind of like start to help you piece together. The Old Testament is about Jesus. And I'm going to make that point more explicitly in just a second. But redemption is God's love on display for his people when he becomes a man to live the perfect life that we can't live and die the death that we deserve so that he can set us free from bondage to sin and bondage to death. So he can set us free from all the things that enslave us, all the things that, that, that steal our heart's affection and attention away from him, who is truly life. That's redemption. Ephesians 1.7 says this, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Jesus is our redemption. He's our only source of hope and salvation. And then uh, fourthly is consummation or, or the new creation. And that is the future promise that when Christ comes back and brings his kingdom, those who have repented and believed in Jesus, and for us, that's going to be the best day ever. It is going to be glorious. And for people who have not repented and believed in Jesus, that is going to be the most frightening day and the first day of the worst eternity imaginable. But Jesus is going to come back and he is going to make all things new. In Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, Jesus says that he's making all things new. He's going to wipe every tear from our eyes and we're going to be with him away from the presence of sin and pain and in the presence of eternal joy and love and peace for all eternity. And it's going to be glorious. So creation, fall, redemption, consummation. That's one way to summarize the storyline of the Bible, but don't miss this. The point is that it's all, all of scripture is about Jesus and his gospel. It's all about Jesus and his salvation and his love and mercy that he reveals for us in the good news. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Maybe it's a type, maybe it's a shadow, uh, maybe it's a promise that, that Jesus fulfills. This is what Jesus says in John chapter five. So he's arguing with the Pharisees and, and he tells them this line, this is John 5, 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me. Now, I'm sure the Pharisees noticed that uh, uh, Jesus is not actually anywhere in the Old Testament, not explicitly, but in types and shadows and promises, it's all about Jesus. He says, you search the scriptures, but it's they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. For if you, if you believed in Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. In Jesus's understanding of the entire scriptures, he looks at the Old Testament and he says, yeah, it's all about me. Moses wrote about me. The prophets wrote about me. All right. Uh, in case you're like, maybe not fully convinced, you, you want to read scripture or like commit 
serious time to, to Bible reading uh, as just like a regular daily habit. I want to talk about why we should read the Bible for, for just a couple minutes. And I think the ultimate purpose of reading the Bible is to know and enjoy Jesus. All right. It's the God who created us and who loves us and who died for us. This is why I read scripture so I can know him and, and become more like him and, and to have a relationship with him and to receive the forgiveness that comes from knowing the gospel that's preached in, in this word. So Paul in addressing Timothy says this, this is in second Timothy three. He says, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings or the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That's really the most important thing that happens through the scriptures. We have the scriptures and now we can be wise for salvation. Now we can know the Jesus who died for us. Now we can know the God who loves us and experience what it's like to have a relationship with him. Now, there are a bunch of other things that scripture does in our lives. I'll give you just like a quick sort of sampling. Uh, one of the things is uh, it gives you faith. If you feel like, man, I'm lacking in faith, like my faithometer is like mm, low. Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. So if you need faith, get in the scriptures. Another thing, it helps you mature. It helps you grow spiritually. Jesus' best friend, Peter, says this in 1 Peter uh Chapter two, verse two, like newborn infants desire the pure milk of the word so that by it, you may grow up into salvation. In other words, if you feel like I got room to grow, I could mature a little bit. Read the scriptures. The scriptures will mature you. They will help you grow spiritually. It also sanctifies you. It makes you holy, it cuts off the things in your life that need to be cut off. Jesus put it this way in, in John 17, 17. He says, he's praying for the disciples and he says to, to, to God, the father, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. You ever feel dirty? Come read God's word. It washes you, it cleanses you, it cuts off the things that need to be cut off. Another thing is it sets you free. Reading scripture has the benefit of bringing liberation and freedom in our lives. Jesus says this in John 8. He says, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. If you have any area of bondage in your life or in your thinking, and who doesn't? Being in scripture will be the thing that helps bring continual freedom and cleansing to your heart and to your mind. And then one last thing is it revives and it enlightens. Now, Psalm 19 says a whole bunch more other things on, on, on what God's word does, but just verse seven says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The word of the Lord is what revives. My brother, my sister, if you feel heavy or if you feel weary, binge watching Netflix is not gonna help you. Continuing to scroll TikTok or Instagram reel are not gonna help you. What you need is to get into God's presence and hear his word that refreshes the heart and revives the soul. This is what you need. This is food for your soul. And we get into it for our own delight, for our own joy, for our own revival. And we neglect it to our own peril. And so much more. Okay, this is just a sampling list. John Piper, who's one of my heroes, summarizes the idea of getting in God's word this way. So I have, I have a slide for it. So he says this. God has made the written word as indispensable as the incarnate word, so Jesus. For the achievement of God's ultimate purpose, he has made Christ essential and the Bible essential. The Bible is not as glorious or as ultimate or as foundational as Christ, but both are indispensable. And he goes on to say this, without the written word explaining and preserving for us who God is and what he has done, there would be no saving knowledge of God, no new birth, no faith, no seeing and savoring of God's glory, no experience of forgiveness, no transformation, and in the end, no completed and beautified bride for the son and no white hot worshiping family for the father. This is why we need scripture. Scriptures are necessary. Okay, I wanna transition into sharing a few uh, uh, convictions, okay, around how do we approach the Bible, okay? And I have a, I have a slide for that too. Thanks, Axel. You're the best. I, I really appreciate you jumping in there. All right. So five essential convictions on, on how to approach 
scripture, okay? And then I'm going to give you five interpretation principles. Okay, so five and five. Here are the first five. Scripture is authoritative. Somebody say authoritative. 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 Man, we love that word, don't we? Our generation, we just, we love authority. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'll do what you tell me. I won't think twice about it. <laughs> oh, that's good, Scott. I, man, yeah. The, man, when, when my sarcasm backfires. All uh, right. Thank you for that, Scott. So scripture is authoritative. All right. And that's, that can be hard for us to hear, but not when you remember that the one who's authoritative through the scripture is the one who's all good and all loving and who exercises his authority for your flourishing and for your thriving. So we gladly submit to the authority of God's word. So God's word is authoritative because it's inspired by God. Okay. Not in the sense of like, oh, that was so inspiring. Like, no, not, not that. Uh, the word for, for inspired in the New Testament, theonosta, literally means breathed out by God. God's word. Paul puts it this way. This is uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture, okay, Old and New Testament, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. In other words, when God speaks, okay, when, when scripture speaks, God speaks. When I obey scripture, I'm obeying God. And when I disobey scripture, I'm disobeying God. This is God's word. And because it's inspired, it's authoritative. Again, this is uh, Jesus' best friend, Peter. He, he puts it this way in 2 Peter 1. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's the doctrine of the inspiration of scripture and the authority of scripture, that scripture comes from God. And because it comes from the mouth of God, then it's final. And, and this is what the reformers had rediscovered. They had said, we're not going to submit to church councils over scripture, we're going to elevate scripture and examine everything else by it. Are you tracking with me? Does that distinction make sense? We are going to elevate scripture instead of our own opinion over scripture. And so this, this also means like, if I have a tiff with scripture, okay, if I read something that I don't like in scripture, uh, I'm not going to put myself in a position of authority or I'm like, ah, primitive, old, like, how could God say that? Like, I don't believe that. I'm no, 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 no. The problem is probably on my end. It's probably in my fallen misunderstanding. And that's okay. It's an invitation for deeper study and an invitation to know God more through his word. So the second thing is that scripture is inerrant. Inerrant means without error. Okay. And it's the simple affirmation that uh, the Bible does not affirm anything that's contrary to truth. All right, everything that the scriptures teach is true. Titus 1, 2, uh, Paul calls God the God who never lies. Okay, if, it's the, if God is the God who never lies, then when he speaks, his words are true. And, and in Hebrews also, Hebrews 6, 18 says it is impossible for God to lie. That would be contrary to his nature, contrary to who God is. And so if, like I was saying, there is a misunderstanding between me and scripture, and there's something that is like really rubbing me the wrong way or that I don't understand, I can just assume that the problem is probably on my end. And I'll tell you, as somebody who's had my fair share of things that have rubbed me the wrong way, as I've read the Bible and, and have done a lot of work to wrestle with these things, there are so many good answers. All right. You're not the first Christian to have a hard time with whatever it is that you're thinking about, whether it's hell or homosexuality. I'm telling you, Christian thinkers and theologians and pastors and leaders and just thoughtful Christians have wrestled with whatever it is they've wrestled with. And there are lots of good answers. Lots of good answers. I'll hang around after. And if you have a particular thing that irks you about the Bible, I would love to talk to you about it. I would love to talk to you about it. I, uh, I'm not going to share the full story here tonight, but I went through a season of deconstruction where I didn't believe certain parts of the Bible. And I was like, uh, I don't know about that. And I started kind of chucking things out the window and I was just walking that fine line and man, God had mercy on me and the Lord brought me back. But 
I, I was really, really having a hard time with some things that scripture plainly teach. And I could only like dance around it and make it, you know, do theological gymnastics and make it, you know, what I wanted it to be for so long before it's like, ah, that's actually not what it teaches. And I need to just accept God's word and submit to it for what it says. Are y'all tracking with me? Okay. Keep going. Uh, this is uh, number three is super important, but uh, the doctrine of the clarity of scripture. All right. Sometimes called the perspicuity of scripture. Okay. Keep that in your back pocket. Talk to your pastor about it. You're like pastor, why didn't you ever talk to us about the perspicuity of scripture? But it's a doctrine that was also recovered by the reformers. And it's the simple idea that what the Bible says can actually be understood by anybody. All right. The Bible is not hard to understand. Sure. There are things in it that are hard to understand. And sure. If you commit your life to studying scripture, you will be better at answering some hard questions and navigating through some tough topics. But generally speaking, the Bible is written for you and me. And we can, we can read it in our mother tongue, whether that's English or something else, without needing a degree in Greek or Hebrew or Bible. And that we can actually know what God wants us to know for salvation simply by reading scripture. The scriptures are clear. This is very, very important. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses says uh, these words. He says, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie, when you rise. So it is understood that children are supposed to be able to grasp something of God's message that he gave to his people through Moses. And if children can understand it, all right, we can understand it. All right, number four. The scripture is to be read and meditated upon regularly. All right, if you've been around church any length of time, uh, these two scriptures you've probably heard before, but Psalm 1 says this, blessed is the man who does not uh, sit in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night, day and night. Uh, and there's a, there's a similar passage in Joshua where the Lord speaks to Joshua and he tells him this, uh, be strong, be courageous, uh, don't turn from my word to the right or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it again day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So the vision of being in scripture and meditating on it day and night is, is this, that you would be shaped by the Bible, that you would be influenced by who you're becoming okay, tomorrow, next year, that that person is so influenced by the Bible that scripture would actually be the, the, the main aspect of your formation, of your intellectual formation, your spiritual formation. That's the vision that I'm here all the time, that it begins to color the way that I see everything else. And, and through this lens, I see my friends and my enemies and the world and my life every day. Here's what uh, Martin Luther, our, our, our monk friend, this is what he says uh, about meditation. In your study of the Bible, I have a slide uh, of that, thanks Axel. In your study of the Bible, you should meditate. That is not only in your heart, but also externally by actually repeating and comparing oral speech and literal words of the book, reading, rereading with diligent attention and reflection so that you may see what the Holy Spirit means by them. And take care that you do not grow weary or think that you have done enough when you have read, heard, and spoken them once or twice and that you have complete understanding. You will never be a particularly good theologian if you do that. For you will be like untimely fruit, which falls to the ground before it is half ripe. I love that line. I don't know about you, but just as a Christian, I would like to be a particularly good theologian. Okay? A theologian is just somebody who thinks in, about God and studies God. And so if you're a Christian, you're a theologian, maybe not professionally, and, uh, but, but, but still, you want to be a good theologian. And if you want to do that, then that means I don't want to just read like a cursory reading and just kind of like check my reading off for today. I want to like pause, I want to do like a couple laps around that verse again. I want to say it out loud. I want to try to memorize it. And if you meditate, if you kind of do what Luther is describing here, you will find that scripture will actually like steep deep in your heart. 
And that's one of the great things that you could do to kind of like massage the truths of scripture into your heart. So just reading it, 10 seconds, pause, read, reread, think about it. Personally, I find that meditation is actually the missing link between my Bible reading and my prayer. When I can meditate at the end of my Bible reading, it really helps fuel my prayers. There was a Puritan named uh, Thomas Manton, and he says this, the word feeds meditation and meditation feeds prayer so that your prayers will not be barren. So here's a tip on prayer, okay? If you feel like sometimes, man, my prayer is dry. I just pray about me, myself, and I, and kind of my problems. Uh, that's okay. If you just start with scripture and meditate on the scripture that you're reading and allow that to feed your prayers. All right. Number five, scripture is to be approached in humility and prayer. Now, why is this important? Like, why should I just like open up the Bible? Because you're a sinner. All right. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And our, the sinner's natural inclination is actually to suppress the truth of God's word, is to not believe God's word. Now, as a Christian, you have a new heart. You have a new mind. That is true. But you also have remaining sin, indwelling sin. And so, therefore, you should just, when you come to reading the Bible, just pause and ask God for help. Lord, speak to me. One of the prayers I, I use, I learned it from my seminary professor, Dr. Jack Davis, but he encouraged us to pray, in your presence, Lord, come Holy Spirit. 10 seconds, just pause, be silent, pray something like that. And we have examples of praying for your Bible understanding in the scripture. So Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, has uh, several verses that talk about that. So I'm gonna just read you a few. Uh, he says this in Psalm 119, verse 10, with my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Verse 12, blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Verse 18, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things in your law. And then uh, 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 one, one more verse, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. And so the idea is like, you should just remember that sin has affected all of your faculties, your mind, your will, your heart, your emotions. And therefore, when you come to God, just ask for his help. Uh, again, uh, one more Martin Luther quote. This is the last Martin Luther quote. Okay, all right, get off my back. Uh, he says this, thus you see how David keeps praying in the above mentioned Psalm, Psalm 119. Teach me, Lord, instruct me, lead me, show me, and many more words like these. Although he well knew and daily heard and read the text of Moses and other books beside, still he wants to lay hold of the real teacher of the scriptures himself. I love that line. That's what we want. I, I don't want to just meet with, with Paul or David. I want to lay hold on the real teacher of scriptures. That's the Holy Spirit. So that he may not seize upon them mingled with his reason and become our own teacher. For such practice gives rise to factitious spirits who allow themselves to nurture the delusion that the scriptures are subject to them and can be easily grasped with their reason as if they were Markov or uh, think like a uh, Tolkien or Rowling uh, or Aesop's fables for which no Holy Spirit is needed and no prayers are needed. So all I'd say, we approach the scriptures with humility and prayer, seeking to obey. It. All right. Uh, James's, uh, uh, Jesus's brother, James, says this in chapter one. Blessed are those who don't just hear the word, but do the word. Jesus, says, don't be just a hearer, be a doer. We approach the scriptures with humility and prayer. Okay. And uh, here's the last thing I'm going to share with you guys is, is five interpretation guidelines. So hermeneutics is the science of interpreting scripture. So hermeneutical principles, all right, guidelines. The first one, it's all about, Jesus. come on, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We saw that earlier, okay? Jesus himself said, hey, the scriptures testify about me. The scriptures bear witness about me. There's a, a great 19th century uh, British preacher at Metropolitan Tabernacle Church in London. His name was Charles Spurgeon. And uh, he was responding to a man who had preached a sermon and there was no Jesus in the sermon. And so Charles Spurgeon was like, where is Jesus in your sermon? And the young man was like, uh, well, there was no Jesus in the text itself. So like, what am I supposed to do? There's no Jesus in that like passage of the Bible. And so here's Charles Spurgeon's brilliant response. Uh, and, I, and I have this up. Uh, do you not know that from every little town and village and tiny hamlet in England, there is a road leading to London? Whenever I get a hold of a text, I say to myself, there is a road from here to Jesus Christ. And I mean to keep on his track 
until I get to him. I love that so much. All right. Now, you know, maybe he does that like artificially to a fault. And he's like, oh, this thing here is like about Jesus. Like, oh, is it? You know, I don't know about that. Uh, but 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 I love I love the, the 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 fact that like that is our heart's attitude. That's our orientation. As we come to scripture, I'm looking for Jesus. I, I want to meet Jesus. When even when I'm in the Old Testament, I'm reading the law. I'm like, thank you, Lord, that you have fulfilled the law. You have satisfied the requirements of the law so that I can receive your righteousness as a free gift. On uh, in, in Luke 24, uh, Jesus is uh, walking on the road to Emmaus with a couple of his dis disciples. And he says this uh, to them, uh, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So my one kind of tip for reading the Old Testament is like, whatever you're reading in the Old Testament is either a promise that's fulfilled in Jesus, or uh, it is a story that anticipates or prepares us for Jesus in some way. It's all about Jesus. We don't read the Old Testament as like Israelites, as Jews. We read the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. So we read the Old Testament as Christians, looking at it through the lens of Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection. So that's the first interpretation principle. It's all about Jesus. Okay, the second one is this. Scripture interprets Scripture. How many guys have ever heard that phrase before? Scripture interprets Scripture. Yeah, a few of you guys. Okay, so uh, this is sometimes called the analogy of faith or the analogy of Scripture. But the idea is this. There are things in the Bible that are hard to understand, that are obscure. And so what do we do with those passages? We interpret the things that are unclear in light of the passages that are more clear. All right. The way that cults start is they take something that's like obscure and unclear and they're like, ah, this is it. Like, we're going to give it like our spin and, you know, you can make it sound however you want. And that's not how you read the Bible. The analogy of scripture says that scripture is its own interpreter. So if there is something that's vague or that I don't understand, I need to examine the rest of the scriptures and be like, okay, well, what does the rest of the Bible say about this topic? And I'll give you guys, I'll give you guys an example. So in Genesis 17, the Lord tells Abraham that all of the men who worship God, who are part of the covenant community, need to be circumcised. If that's all I read, I might come to the conclusion that like anybody who follows the Lord who's a male, who's part of the covenant community should be circumcised. But actually in the New Testament, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, he says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. All that matters is obeying th the Lord. And, uh, and, then, and then we see like, oh, it's actually not even about physical circumcision. It's about the circumcision of the heart. So there are multiple layers to this topic and I can't understand it just by reading that story in Genesis. Does that make sense? We need to see what all of scripture says about a topic so that we can understand it properly. And, and we need to allow God's word to speak how it wants to speak instead of us reading into it what we want to read, which is really easy to do. A lot of people do that, okay? How many of you guys ever heard a bad sermon before? Yeah, too many to count. Uh, this is what, what John Calvin says, and I have this up also. Uh, he says, in the f uh, it is the first business of an interpreter to let, yeah, I love that photo. <laughs> so get up. Uh, it's the first business of an interpreter to let his author say what he does say instead of attributing to him what we think he ought to say. All right. So, so it's the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Uh, exegesis is, is we, we bring out of the book what's, what's, what's in there already, okay? Eisegesis is me putting it into it and making it say what I want it to say, all right? So it's the difference between like, oh, I need to like, you know, give a word of encouragement to my friend. Let me just like find something that like matches what I want to say and then do that uh, as opposed to like just reading what I'm reading and allowing that to kind of set the tone and set the message and allowing the speaker to say what he wants to speak. And so related to that is rule number three, which is to pay attention to the grammar. Somebody say grammar. grammar. Yay, grammar. Uh, the Lord inspired the scriptures to be written in a human language. And so the biblical authors, the, the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, Koine Greek New Testament, followed the rules of grammar in their writing. And all of the translators who work on all our English translators follow the rules of grammar. Grammar matters. Grammar matters. The verb tenses matter. The singulars and the plurals and everything matters. 
when it comes to the grammar. And so actually uh, one of Martin Luther's best friends, Philip Melanchthon, uh, says it this way. So his kind of two rules on, on theology, his two principles are the, princi the, the scriptures must be understood grammatically before they can be understood theologically. All right, here's why they'll help you avoid a lot of problems. If you come to scripture with your theology already, then you're going to miss what scripture is trying to say and you're going to like force it to fit what you believe. But if I come to scripture and say, well, let's just kind of hold off on what we believe and just examine what the scripture says and go from there. Well, then you can get to the author's intent. So, so Philip Melanchthon says that the scriptures must be understood grammatically before they can be understood theologically. And secondly, that the scriptures have but one simple and certain sense. All right. In other words, it's not as though we could read scriptures and then all of us ask, okay, well, what does this mean to you? What this means to me is like, who cares? Who cares? Who cares what it means to you? Th these are words written in time and space in a language with grammar rules. And so they have a specific meaning. Now in their application, they can have multiple applications and that's fine. But in their intended meaning, we need to, we need to be considering like, hey, what did the author mean to be heard? Okay, what would the first hearers of this letter have received this as, uh, understood it as? All right, so in other words, I can't read Revelation and be like, oh yeah, the flying, you know, kind of uh, bug monsters there are these like choppers and these like airplanes from the military. It's like, I don't think that John in the first century BC, first century AD, was, was, was thinking about choppers, okay? That's, that's, nobody would have understood that, okay? Are you guys tracking with me? The grammar is important. The grammar matters. The words matter. Jesus says there's not an iota or a dot in scripture that will, that will pass away. It's all important. Proverbs 30 says every word of God proves true. God does not waste a word or a jot or a tittle. Number four, pay attention to the context. Pay attention to the context. And what I mean by that is the context, like don't airlift a quote from scripture without reading that paragraph and without reading the book and kind of understanding the entire context around it. So just so you know, God did not inspire verses like fortune cookies. All right. This is one line. Well, that one line has a context. There's a verse before it and a verse after it and, and the author's intent. Yeah, I kid you not. True story. Somebody sitting in your seats. Okay. He's graduated a long time now, a former student. This is how he read his Bible. He would flip it open and put his finger down on a random verse and read that as if that's how God spoke to him. Guys, the Bible is not written in fortune cookie verses. The Bible is written in whole books that have a context, that have a literary style, that have a genre. And we need to know these things. So I'll give you one, one example. Uh, Philippians 4.13. Who knows what Philippians 4.13 says? Yeah, go ahead. Just say it. Oh, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen, somebody. I'm going to put that up in my garage gym. Just Philippians 4.13, I could do all things. One more set. That's not what Philippians 4.13 are talking about. Right before that verse, Paul says this. So he's in prison. He's writing in prison. And that's important for context. And he says this. I've learned in every situation, whether I have a lot or whether I have a little, whether I'm abounding or whether I'm struggling, I've learned to be content. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Oh, the context changes. It It means that what Paul is talking about is like, you know, maybe he was fit. He probably walked everywhere, but that's not what he's talking about. Paul is talking about the ability to endure suffering and to endure lack by Christ who strengthens him. This is why the context matters. And the fifth and the last one, I'm going to land the plane here, is uh, we need to read scripture in community in community. Y'all, God created you to know him and to experience him in the context of Christian brothers and sisters around you. You're not made to do life alone. You need friends. You need brothers and sisters in your life. That's how God created you. So you can, so you can grow and learn in community. And in, the, in God's community, God had especially gifted certain people to be teachers. And so we learn from them. I'm so thankful for the teachers in my life that have taught me God's word and continue to teach me God's word, whether I'm listening to a sermon or whether I'm reading a book and studying and preparing for this thing. 
if we are not learning from Christian teachers, we are missing out. So read the Bible in community with Christians, with Christians living and dead. All right. So, so that is like, you know, people like Martin Luther, we, we quote him. We read the Bible with Martin Luther tonight. That's what we did a little bit. But read and study with your friends in Bible course. Uh, it, you'll, be, you'll be better for it, okay? And you'll get better at it the more that you do it. Okay? Bible reading is not a science. It's an art. It's like a sport. If you want to get better at it, just practice. Just jump in and read. Read with your friends. You will learn from them. Uh, you can also... Listen to good preaching. That's very important. By the way, if you're in a church that does not preach God's word, what are you doing there? I'm serious. If you're not in a Bible-believing church that preaches God's word, you need to go find one, okay? Because you are missing out. Uh, and thirdly, you can consult like good commentaries and good Christian books. I'll give you two resources tonight. Uh, the first one is a commentary by Matthew Henry, who's a Puritan. Uh, he was born in 1662 today. Uh, his birthday is October 18th. Happy birthday, Matthew Henry. Uh, he, was a, he was an English Puritan and he was a minister in the Church of England. And uh, his commentary is available online. I've included a link to it in the PDF, which I'm going to give you guys in just a second. Uh, but also my favorite study resource for background, context, uh, cultural kind of background stuff is the ESV Study Bible. And the reason I love the ESV Study Bible is because it's written by a massive group of evangelical scholars. So it's not just one person that has like their own bias in there. In fact, oftentimes where there are multiple interpretations for a passage, they'll just tell you like, okay, some people believe this, some people believe that, and some people believe this, and the evidence for this is strong, and the evidence for that is, you know, kind of weak. And like, you can kind of, you know, think about it. Uh, but the introductions for their uh, books of the Bible are fantastic. And at the end of the ESV study Bible, there's a collection of articles. And some of those articles they're, they're short, but they're really good. It's like how to read the Bible, how to read the Bible theologically, how we got the Bible, the reliability of the Old Testament, the re reliability of the New Testament. If you own an ESV study Bible, awesome. Scroll to the back and start reading those things. If you don't and you want one, come talk to me after and I will get you one. All right? Okay. You're welcome. That's, um, all right. We can, we can, I'm going to, I want to give the last word to uh, this uh, my. Uh, this guy named R.C. Sproul, okay? He went on to be with the Lord a little while ago. And then I'll tell you what's, what's in that PDF in a second. He says this, We who live in the Western world are living in a post-Christian era. The influence of the church has been greatly eroded in our culture. That means the influence of Christian people have, has been weak. I believe that a crucial key for church renewal, and I would add personal renewal, is uh, to be found in adult education regarding the scriptures. He says, I dream of a multitude of articulate and knowledgeable Christians making a new impact on our society. And that dream cannot be realized unless we know and use the tools of intelligent Bible study. And I promise you guys something tonight. If you will commit yourself to daily, regular intake of God's word in some capacity, that you will be better for it and the world will be better for it. Amen. All right. So if you, if you uh, want to just Go there and scan that. That's yours. It has a bunch of resources that I've put together. And one of the things uh, in there is actually a guide to kind of getting started with Bible reading. All right. And so you can just follow those steps. I won't go through them. And uh, I have a bunch of like links in there. So you're going to want to just check those out. And then at the very end, I have... Uh, the, the inductive Bible study kind of questions for you to use as you read scripture. And then appendix four and five are the shortened list of new and old Testament books for a reading plan. So if you would like a reading plan, that is a very simple one that you can follow. All right. I'm going to pray for us and I'll turn things over back to our amazing MCs. And I'll be hanging around after. If you have questions, you want to talk, I'll be hanging around after. God, thank you uh, for tonight. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here in this room. Uh, Lord, Lord, I'm sorry for all the times that I've neglected to spend time in your word. And uh, Lord, I pray for all of us here uh, who have done that. Uh, Lord, thank you that there is mercy and forgiveness. And uh, Lord, thank you that we don't have to come to you and make anything up. Thank you that your love and forgiveness are a free gift in Christ. Oh Lord, we want to know you. So give us a deeper hunger and longing for the scriptures, for your word. We want to be a people who are 
faithful to scripture, who know scripture, and uh, people who look like Jesus uh, because we encounter him as we come to scripture. And uh, Lord, I pray for any of us here who are uh, discouraged or uh, just feel stalled. Uh, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just blow a fresh wind of refreshing in our lives, uh, that we would be able to pursue you with a new vigor and a new passion and a new energy because you are worth it. And thank you that you're the one who enables our love and our effort. Uh, Lord, we love you and uh, we commit to you the rest of tonight. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Thank you.